Good day to you. And where have you been in the world? Odd question, right? Not really for a class like this, which is going to take you to Sweden. For many of you, this will be your first trip abroad. For some of you, you've been somewhere before and you have that hankering to go somewhere else. I myself always have that hankering because I love to travel to different places. And as I stand here in my office, I'm reminded at, at things that remind me of other places in the world that I've been to. And here we have my Penn State diploma for my doctoral degree, but that reminds me of when I was going to England regularly and collecting some of the beer cans that you see over there on the wall, beautiful English beer cans, which I collected over the years. They're, they're like little artistic paintings. And down here we have a family photo of mine from our trips to Mexico. So I like to travel. And like you, if you've been places, you collect little pieces of where you go. And that's one of the reasons that I'm so adamant about being able to expose my students in my classes to different countries and ultimately different cultures, because there's so much to see out there in the world. So welcome, welcome to Comparing Media from Around the World. My name is Rob McKenzie. If you don't know me already, we're going to be meeting very soon in a very intimate setting because we're all going to be taking a class together in a country, flying on an airplane, and enjoying the Scandinavian culture. That's where we're headed. So what I'm going to do in the rest of this instructor video is I'm going to address the first chapter in the book, the introduction, and set up why it's so important that we do study media from around the world. And it's partly about the world being so big. The world is just humongous, right? It's so big that you just don't know how big it is because so few people get to see most of the countries in the world. There's about 200 countries in the world, right? How many are you going to get to see by the time your dance on this earth is done, so to speak? Probably a handful if you're like most people. Probably five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You're really rare if you've seen 30, 40, 50. Super rare if you've seen 100 countries by being in those countries. There's 200 and yet we only see so small a portion of the world. So why not study it? And in fact, whether we want to or not, we study the world all the time through the media that we access. That's where we're learning about the world by surfing the web, by glimpsing a television show, by listening to a song from an artist from another country. So the world is a monstrous place. It's got, it's got so many languages to it, too. We know that the biggest languages in the world is, is kind of a surprise to most people that the, most people are speaking Chinese in the world. That's the language that has most people speaking it. But that's only because there's so many people who are Chinese speaking Mandarin Chinese. So those people are concentrated in one particular part of the globe. Whereas Spanish, the second most spoken language, has been spread through really the Spanish Empire and the Spanish colonization of South and Central America and some of the Caribbean where that Spanish language was pushed out throughout the world. And then there's English, which is in the third position, but it's actually spoken in more places, if you can imagine that. So English also spread by the English colonization and spread throughout the world. So most spoken language, you think, because it's spoken in most countries. Most, there are more countries where English is spoken, is a better way to say it, like one of the countries studied in this book, Ghana. You would never expect Ghana to be an English-speaking country being in Africa, but it is. So England has English has that dimension about it, and also it's the most common language on the internet. So English has a few things that make it stand out. So we talk about media in this class, and we talk very specifically about four media. That's what we focus on. We look at television, radio, newspapers, and the internet. And we focus on those four main legacy media. Some may call them the internet is not legacy media per se. Newspapers, books, and radio are. But the internet is becoming kind of a legacy medium because it's been replaced by social media, namely the cell phone. But this book and my class focuses on those four media. As We're going to take a look at those four media in Sweden, in the country of Sweden, where things are very, very different. And speaking of Sweden, we're going to take a look at a lot of countries in this class. Sweden will be the focus of the countries, but we've also got two other European countries. We've got 
the UK, which some people say refer to as England. It's not. The UK is four different countries making up a kingdom, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, and England. We say England because it's the biggest part and has the most output of media. But we're studying the UK, we're studying Sweden, we're studying France. So we've got three European countries. We're studying the US, we're studying Mexico, we're studying China, we're studying Lebanon, and we're studying Ghana. So we've got a range of countries around the world. We've got a Middle Eastern country, we've got an African country, we've got an Asian country. We do not have a Central American country. We do not have a South American country. We have a sort of Muslim country. That would be Lebanon. About 60% of it is Muslim. We have a country that is uh, representing, in a way, Hispanic culture, Mexico, though it is also in North America. So we've got a range of countries, but there's also limitations, and I talk about those limitations in the book, as, as we are limited to, to not having as geographical e equal spread around the world as we could have with the countries we're studying this book. But really, you can take what we're learning in this class and apply it to any country in the world. Italy, Argentina, it doesn't matter because the way that this book and the class are broken down, you'll see it breaks it down into concepts that you can apply to any particular country. And it really, we want to get beyond looking at country as a unit. That's what this book, it does in a way. It says, okay, we have these countries, but just like the, the World Cup, the World Cup soccer tournament that's going on now, you know, the U.S. was knocked out. And I knew many people who, they weren't even that big as soccer fans, but suddenly not only are they soccer fans, but now they're Mexico fans. They become Mexicans because Mexicans are representing North America. And today they are Mexican when the Mexicans are playing football, as the Mexicans call it, or soccer, as we Americans call it. And it's an example of stepping outside of your country and saying, you know, today we're North Americans. And in fact, that term American is really a misnomer if you call yourself it because Canadians are Americans and Mexicans are Americans. We are all North Americans and even, even Guatemalans are Americans because they're Central Americans. So just think about that. That's stepping outside of looking at your country as a unit of organizing and organizing yourselves according to tastes, in this case, soccer. All right, now what's the importance of comparing? This book is called Comparing Media from Around the World. The class is called Comparative Media. Why do we compare? In academia, we compare because it gives us a point of reference. We can look over there at that and then we can learn what we are here. So that's how you learn that you're tall because you look at that person over there who's short. But that's how you learn that you're short. You look over there at that person who's tall. We do the same with countries. We learn that the U.S. is like Japan in its economy being very capitalistic. But it's like Canada in the way that people look, generally speaking. Or... England is kind of like Japan because they're both islands and they have a certain men mentality, but they're completely different in their in their what they prefer to eat. Um, so there, we learn by comparing. Comparing gives us a point of reference. It also it helps helps us to overcome what I refer to as cultural myopia. Cultural myopia is a problem. It's a concept that I use. It's borrowing a concept from the optical industry, the optical profession, eyesight. Cultural myopia. Myopia is short-sightedness. It's when you look at something there, but when you pull it away, it starts to get blurry. Cultural myopia is myopia that it leads you to judge another culture because it's blurry to you. It's blurry to you because you don't have any experience in that culture. So you have experience in what's in front of you, your own culture, the United States, crossing the street, driving in a vehicle, waiting in line, going through a toll booth, signing up for a class, all these things that you do on a regular basis in the U.S., that's your foreground. But in the background, uh, Venezuela and uh, what you have for dinner in, in Venezuela, or Australia and how you pay your property taxes, or England and how you drink your beer. That's how they drink beer in England. That's the blurry part, so it's, it's out of focus, right? So we sometimes then refer to taking the beer example. We take something like British beer and we say, oh, the Brits, they like their beer warm, right? That right there is a sign that you are experiencing cultural myopia because you haven't tasted British beer, perhaps, and so you're referring to it as warm, but really it's served at 58 degrees. That's the proper temperature to serve an ale. 
And an ale is the kind of beer that's most common in Britain. That's what it's known for. They have lagers too, like Budweiser, etc. But mostly it's ales. And so for their ale, um, they serve it at 58 degrees, which means their beer is warmer. It's warmer than our beer. It's not necessarily warm. And that's a, a tiny distinction with wording, but it's showing cultural myopia. When you experience British beer, you realize that, right? In the meantime, you're, the world in front of you is blurry. So when you see people on television and and in on a news program in Sweden and there, there's, there's a coverage of a war and you see a guy and he's bleeding, you're shot. And you pull back and you think, oh my God, it's such a violent country, Sweden. It's, well, guess what? Not really. Sweden actually is against violence, but in this case, they believe that if violence is going to occur as it does in war, you must be realistic. Where are you realistic? On the news. So you do show the horrors of war. Now you're clearing up that culture myopia about Sweden. You might have judged it differently without that experience and recognizing the myopia that you have might have. So comparing things, comparing things allows us to overcome cultural myopia. There's another term that I use in this book and in this class, and that is rhetorical perspective. This book and this class has a rhetorical perspective. Rhetorical, a rhetorical perspective is the ability to analyze the meaning of a piece of communication without judging the value of the sender of the communication. So in other words, we're not going to say that France is better than the United States, is better than China, is better than Mexico, is better than Lebanon, and so on when it comes to X, Y, Z, and media. We're not doing that. We're going to talk about advantages and disadvantages of different ways that the countries are structured in the ways the their media systems are set up. But we're not going to say that one is better than another. That's not what a rhetorical analysis does. A rhetorical analysis says that any any interpretation is valid of what we're looking at. Any meaning is valid. As long as you support your your contention with arguments and evidence, then you are then you're making an argument that is sound and is rhetorical. And this class has a, has a rhetorical perspective. If you've taken classes in communication, you hopefully will know a little bit more about that term. All right, now that takes us to the audience for this class and for this book. You, it's, you have a dual function because you are both readers of this book and people in my class. So that's one audience, the academic audience. But then you're also consumers of media. And you're going to be in a Swedish setting. And you're going to be exposed and unexposed, if I can say things that way. Because you'll find that some Swedish areas of life are off limits to media. Uh, you'll be intrigued by that, I hope. Um, so, But you will see other uses of media that you don't see in the United States. And that's what we want to do. We want to expose you to Swedish media. And so the rest of the book is going to do that in, with a particular organizational structure. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to move now to studying globalization. That's going to be the next chapter that we're going to take on. And that's going to talk about this worldwide climate that's going on that's affecting the way that media are distributed across the world. And then we're going to go to discussing elements of a media system. That's chapter three. That'll happen on Wednesday. And in that chapter, we're going to look at the rest of the book. It's going to break down how a media system has elements to it. And these elements will serve as the chapters for the rest of the course. Each element will be compared across the different countries. So the next element we're going to look at is cultural characteristics, for example. Cultural characteristics are going to be compared across France, uh, the UK, the United States, China, and so on, just looking at cultural characteristics. Then we go on to financing, and we go on to regulation, we go on to accessibility, those are other elements. So you'll find out more about them later. Now this book, this book is a book that took me three years to write, and you're getting firsthand information. In other words, when we talk about, when I talk about France, you should know that I was sitting in the, in the um, high-rise tower of a French executive of the CSA, Consuay, uh, Consuay Service Aquai. I can't remember exactly the, the title. It's a three-letter agency. It's a French government agency regulating media. Same with Sweden. Same with the UK. It was sitting in an Ofcom office. That's the name of the Office of Communication, as it's known. High-level reg regulators and media professionals. I met these people, interviewed them for six of the countries in my book. I did not interview for China or Lebanon because at that time I didn't have the expertise. So I had somebody else write the chapter on China. 
Um, but since then, I've been to China, so now I can speak about it firsthand. And then I had somebody write the chapter on Lebanon, or the chapter material, I should say. So you're getting firsthand information on this book. And as far as travel, I have taken my students in this class to many countries over the years. I've taken students to France three times. I've taken them to the UK four times. I've taken them to Sweden once. I've taken them to Puerto Rico, to St. Croix, to the Dominican Republic, Mexico, China. Yeah, I, I'm sure there's another place that I've left out there. I've, I've taken my students to a lot of places. It's a passion of mine in Sweden is about as good as it gets. You're going to learn a lot about Swedish media and about Swedish cultural in gen general. And I hope you have a wonderful time in comparative media. Welcome to the course.